for joining us today for the Findel Virtual Brain and Mind Seminar. I am really delighted today to be introducing Dr. Jesse Brown. Um, he's joining us today from California, um, rescheduled from an earlier time point. Looks like um, our crowd today is record-breaking numbers, which is quite thrilling uh, for a seminar series we're conducting now kind of at the end of summer. This series is co-organized um, in coordination with the Neuro Events team, uh, Bratislav Misik and Boris Bernhard and myself. Um, so today um, we'll have Jesse Brown. Is, are your slides up and about ready? They are ready, yeah. Awesome, okay. So um, Dr. Brown's work is really focused on understanding and um, unraveling the functional and anatomical brain connectivity as they relate to neurodegenerative disease and disorders, um, as well as advancing neuroimaging approaches um, with data sharing and visualization. So um, there, his website is great and uh, we can share it. A lot of his software is available for download for some of these visualization approaches. So hopefully um, some of the images we see today, you'll be able to reproduce yourself uh, in your own data. Dr. Brown received his PhD in neuroscience at UCLA under the supervision of Susan Buchheimer, um, and then was a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF with uh, Bill Seeley. Uh, and currently he is still at UCSF working um, in collaboration at the, the Memory and Aging Center, where he's an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology. So I'm really excited today to see your talk, Jesse, and um, all the work you've been doing recently. So welcome. Um, and so go ahead and give your talk, and if everyone can stay muted until the end, we'll have a, a, a conversation um, over the chat window. Um, feel free to send your questions, and I'll, I'll read them to you at that point. Um, so Jesse, we'll go ahead and take it away. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Um, I uh, am really uh, thankful for the uh, invitation to speak here today, and sorry that we had a couple uh, scheduling issues. Um, here, I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and share my slides here. Um, I was sorry to uh, I was sorry to miss the um, the HBM you know symposium that we had planned beforehand uh, with uh, looking at connect connectomes across the lifespan. I was looking forward to that. It was going to be my first trip to Montreal, and I was really excited. But um, so it goes. So I'm really excited that you guys have this forum, um, and um, I'm excited to be talking to you at the MNI. I was thinking before this talk that. I've typed the words MNI 152, two millimeter thousands of times. So it's exciting to be finally be uh, kind of meeting with you all virtually at the MNI. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to give you kind of like a, a summary of some work that we recently published and then an update on some, um, some new work that we've been working on that relates to a lot of um, the exciting stuff that's going on at, at the MNI. Um, and so what I'm gonna focus on today is looking at the links between spreading brain atrophy and neurodegenerative disease and how that relates to functional connectivity in the brain, the healthy functional connectivity and how that changes in disease. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards in the chat or um, feel free to email me also if, you, uh, if you'd like to chat about anything. Um, so in our center, so I'm in the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF in the Department of Neurology and we study a broad spectrum of um, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so it's like a tertiary memory clinic. And so we see pa patients with Alzheimer's disease and we see patients with mild cognitive impairment and all different types of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia. Um, and so I, in the beginning of these talks, a lot of times I like to show that the brains of a few of the different patients we see to kind of like illustrate the diversity of the patterns of um, neurodegeneration that we see that underlie the different sort of clinical manifestations of dementia. So um, this is a, a coronal slice of a, a T1 MRI scan from a, from a patient with a behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. And you can see that there's striking atrophy in the insula and the frontal cortex and the striatum, but that there's kind of like relative sparing of some areas like the sort of um, the right temporal lobe. Um, and this um, clinical case of BVFTD was probably due to a, or actually in this case we know was due to an underlying Pick's disease. So that was the neuropathology that caused this pattern of atrophy and this cluster of symptoms. Um, this is a, a, a slice from a patient with the semantic variant of primary progressive aphasia, and they have this profound atrophy that's 
localized in the anterior temporal lobes and it's sort of a left greater than right atrophy pattern and it's pretty focal. You can see atrophy in the hippocampus but you see relative preservation of the occipital cortices. Um, and this is likely due to an underlying TDP43 disease um, that's uh, very commonly associated with this specific pattern of atrophy. And then here, here's a case of a patient with amnestic Alzheimer's disease who has this classic sort of bilateral medial temporal hippocampal atrophy pattern. Um, and so in each case, in each disease, we see these different focal atrophy patterns that affect different brain regions and different brain networks. Um, and there's this relatively focal kind of pattern of onset and of spread. And so that motivates a lot of the work that we do to try and understand how neurodegenerative diseases start, where they start in the brain, and how they progress. And to use that knowledge to then build better translational tools for disease monitoring and for differential diagnosis. Um, and so more broadly in the field across like a wide range of neurodegenerative diseases, there's these striking correspondences between patterns of pathology or neurodegeneration and functional connectivity in a healthy brain. And so I just put up a few different examples here. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with a number of these studies, but um, for example, the patterns of amyloid binding that you see in the brain in Alzheimer's disease correspond very well to the sort of patterns of default mode network connectivity. Um, and so in, in our group, um, so this is a slide from a study that Bill Seeley did in 2009, where he looked at four different types of frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and looked at where the atrophy was most focal in, in each syndrome. So these syndromes are defined clinically. Um, and then looked at um, how those relate to the patterns of functional connectivity that you see between those regions in the healthy brain, which is shown in orange here. And what he showed at the time was that for each of the relatively focal circumscribed patterns of atrophy, it tended to map with a, with a pretty good one-to-one -one correspondence to different intrinsic connectivity networks that we know in the brain. So like the default mode network in Alzheimer's disease, the salience network in BBFTD, um, sort of like a frontoparietal lateralized network in uh, progressive non-fluent aphasia. Um, so it seemed like there was this kind of broader relationship to be probed between the different degeneration patterns we're seeing in functional connectivity. And hopefully that can teach us more about the biology of um, what cell types are affected in the disease and how that affects the sort of patterns of progression. Um, so just an overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna talk about two studies, um, one that was published last year and in, in that study, what we were looking at was, can we use patterns of functional connectivity in the healthy brain to predict for, for individual patients that have different types of frontotemporal dementia? So we focus on BVFTD and semantic variant of PPA. And so we're gonna try and predict future patterns of, of atrophy change longitudinally in, in different individual patients with those syndromes. Um, and this, study was motivated by a lot of previous work in the field um, that's shown that it appears like these diseases maybe start in these epicenters, these specific locations in the brain that have these, you know, characteristic connectivity patterns, and they may progress in a sort of connectional pattern. So um, relating to this idea that these diseases may spread through like a transsynaptic spread type mechanism, in which case the connectivity information is essential for understanding how the disease is going to progress. Um, and there's a lot of cellular evidence for the um, notion of transsynaptic spread in animal models and in postmortem uh, autopsy data, um, both in diseases that are due to an underlying tauopathy or diseases that are underlying um, TDP43 disease. And so these are the two most common pathologies that underlie most types of frontal temporal dementia. And as many of you know, the tau is the main um, neurodegenerative protein in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then the second study is some, some new work um, where we're going to, we look more into what is the relationship between functional connectivity um, and brain activity dynamics and gradients in a way that can tell us more about the sort of spatial phenotypic variability in the brain and how that might relate to selective vulnerability. Um, and so in the first study, the, um, here's just a, the table one from the study of the set of patients that we, um, that we focused on. So there was 72 patients, um, 42 of whom had BVFTD. And we had about three to four longitudinal time points per subject. 
um, separated by about a year per time point. And, and at the beginning time, time point, they already had the, um, the diagnosis of this syndrome. So we're studying patients that are kind of in the like mild to moderate uh, stages of, of the diseases. Um, and so what we're going to what do for each patient at each time point is define like an atrophy map, a gray matter atrophy map that um, we used this procedure called the W score and I won't go into the details, but basically it's a way to define a, a patient specific atrophy map at a given time point. And so for each longitudinal scan that we have, we're going to create uh, one of these W maps and use those to track the individual patterns of change over time. Um, and so what we did first was we wanted to try and identify each patient's epicenter or where in the connectome it would, it's most prob probable that their disease started and spread out from based on patterns of functional connectivity. And so we did that by building a library of functional connectivity maps where we use each region in the brain as a seed, generate the whole brain functional connectivity map, and then do a spatial correlation of that FC map with the atrophy map. And then we identify the region that yielded the map with the best spatial correlation as the epicenter. And so we do that for, um, for each patient for their baseline scan. So we're defining their epicenter in their baseline scan. And we're gonna use that information to predict how um, we think their atrophy is gonna progress. Um, and so one of the motivations for this study was that despite the fact that these two syndromes have relatively similar atrophy patterns, we know that individuals within those syndromes have some heterogeneity. Some people have a more anterior pattern versus a more posterior pattern. Um, some people are faster or slower progressors than others. So that was the motivation for really doing this kind of patient-tailored approach. Um, and so what I'm showing here on the, the top row is just basically like the mean atrophy pattern for each syndrome. And then on the bottom, the yellow regions are the regions that were identified most commonly as the epicenters just based on our procedure. So in BVFTD, the epicenters were most common in the like ventral anterior part of the insula and in the sort of prejonual anterior cingulate cortex. In the patients with semantic variant PPA, we see that the, um, the epicenters are very commonly located in the anterior temporal lobe. So there's only one case of a patient where we found the epicenter in the ACC um, and so we see that there's a, a high degree of sort of like homogeneity in that epicenters that we detect across patients with this um, syndrome. But so when we try and um, sort of quantify the amount of heterogeneity within subjects, we just did a PCA on the atrophy maps. Um, and so what I'm showing here, each dot is a time point for a subject and the longitudinal scans for a subject are connected by lines. And, and you can see that there's a pretty clear sort of linear plane between these two groups. So you have um, that SVPPA up here in red and the BVFTD in blue. And so despite the fact that the atrophy patterns are clearly dissimilar from one another, you see a lot of variability within, uh, within syndromes. Um, and so what we're going to do with the epicenters that we identified is then sort of I, Local, locate those epicenters within the functional connectome and use that to build our model of how the disease is going to be predicted to spread. Um, and so we chose to use the functional connectome for some regions that are, reasons that I'll get into a little bit more later. Um, we did that from, we made the connectome from these 75 healthy older subjects, scanned at our center in a resting state scan, and we used the, the uh, branded tome cortical and subcortical parcellation for that. Um, and so we defined, using a modularity algorithm, we defined all the different intrinsic connectivity networks, which are shown on the, the brain surface here. And then we took the, um, the connectome, the, the group connectivity matrix, and reduced that to two dimensions using a T-SNE algorithm to get this sort of um, spring embedded like diagram here that shows where the different, um, the different connectivity modules are, are localized in the overall pattern of connectivity in the brain. And then subsequently, we're going to superimpose patient atrophy patterns on this to see where they um, sort of localize within the connectome. Um, and so in building a model to predict spread from an epicenter for a patient, we, we defined two main measures that we're going to use to make those predictions. And so the first we call the shortest path length to the epicenter, which is just a basic idea that if this is the epicenter in the connectome, 
And we, we see that this region N has two edges between it and the epicenter. We're going to say that its shortest path to the epicenter is two. And the idea here is basically that um, regions that are more proximal to the epicenter and connectivity space are going to receive pathology from the epicenter sooner, just by the, um, the propagation sort of likelihood over time. Um, and that measure had been described in a previous study from our group. And then for this longitudinal study, we define this new measure that um, we call nodal hazard. And the idea is basically that for a given node, like this node N here, in addition to its um, proximity to the epicenter, another factor that's likely to influence how much sort of disease this node is going to receive is how sort of diseased or sick are each of its neighbors. So in this case, if it has these six neighbors that are all relatively sick, they're, they're going to be in this model transmitting pathology to it. So there's this, this burden or this hazard that's over and above the original sort of kinetics of spread from the epicenter that assumes that the disease is propagating in these, in these sort of downstream regions and that that's going to differentially affect some regions with respect to others. Um, and so we're going to use those two measures and then a number of other covariates in our model to forecast atrophy for each individual. So we're building a single unified model. And so we're putting all of our subjects and all of the brain regions and all of the time points into that single model. Um, and we use a, a model called a generalized additive model with a Gaussian process regression. And we had sort of like the, you know, the covariates that you'd expect in the model, like age and sex and the, um, the type of syndrome that they had. And we also had a spatial autocorrelation factor to control for the sort of like inherent smoothness in these, um, in these atrophy maps. And so here is the results of the model. And so what I'm showing on the x-axis is the amount of longitudinal atrophy that someone had in a given region. So each dot is a region here. And this is the delta W score. So basically how much did their um, atrophy get worse per year in this sort of um, W, which is like a Z-score. And then on the Y is the, um, the amount of atrophy that the model estimated. And so we get a decently good R squared of um, 0.37. So we're not explaining half of the variance, but it's a, it's a highly significant um, model. So in general, it's making pretty accurate forecasts for, um, for most patients. What we, what we wanted to understand next is, um, if there are patients that this model is doing poorly in, can we try and understand why? And can we understand um, conversely who it's doing well in? And so we see that the, the green um, bars in this histogram are the subjects where the model was, did significantly well in this tail of red subjects where it did not do as well. Um, and when we probed the, the subjects in the red bars and asked what, um, what factors led to the model not doing well in forecasting their patterns of change, it did not as well for patients with BVFTD, um, which is somewhat expected based on the, the kind of greater heterogeneity of BVFTD, both anatomically and clinically. Um, furthermore, pa BVFTD patients that had lower baseline atrophy, so if they had very kind of minimal atrophy um, in the beginning, the model did not do as well on them. And for subjects that had a poor fitting epicenter. So we got the spatial correlation coefficient of how the kind of goodness of fit of their epicenter. And what we found was that the patients whose original pattern didn't look very network-like, um, the model did not do as well. At. And so that raises the question, okay, are there some patients on this sort of clinical spectrum who have some neurodegenerative process that maybe isn't spreading in as much of a transsynaptic fashion. And so that's something that we'd like to, um, to keep following up on. Um, and so when we look at the main factors in this model that, um, that predict the sort of pattern of how the disease is gonna spread in an individual, um, I'm just showing the three kind of main and most interesting here. So the path length, the epicenter has this interesting trend. So what we see is that the regions that are right at the epicenter actually don't have the highest rates of change. The regions that are in the second tier, so sort of one edge, edge length away from the epicenter, those are the ones that are showing the most atrophy. Um, and keep in mind that the patients here are in this sort of like mild to moderate phase of the disease. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, for hazard, what we see is that there's this sort of nonlinear effect where the more 
hazard that a, um, that a region has, the multiplicatively more sort of like uh, change in attribute it's gonna have over time. And for baseline atrophy, so we looked at as a region who has a lot of baseline atrophy, maybe less likely to change because it's kind of like already reached a, a ceiling type effect. Um, and we do see that that's the case. So the regions that are most, that change the most are those whose, whose baseline atrophy was at this kind of intermediate level. So not in the beginning and not in the end of the kind of disease process in that area of the brain. Um, and so when you think about this um, sort of pattern of progression from a d disease kinetics type um, perspective and think about the path length to the epicenter for a given region. Um, so a region that's at the epicenter is going to be here on this chart. And if we think about a sort of classic uh, sigmoidal type biomarker curve of how diseases progress, um, the epicenter we would think is going to be localized here. So it's going to be kind of towards the ceiling, towards the end of the disease process, not changing a lot. It's, it's rate of change is starting to slow down over time. A region that's in this sort of second tier, one downstream from the epicenter is right in the inflection of this sigmoid. So it's, um, its rate of change is kind of maximal. And then a region that's, that's more distal from the epicenter is gonna be sort of like further down this curve, presumably in a kind of like ramp up phase of the disease or if the disease ever even makes it to that region. Um, so this just was trying to like unpack these sigmoidal curves a little bit and think about them in kind of like the spatial temporal varying fashion across the brain, which, which is really dependent on which stage of the disease the patient is in and how quickly the, the disease progresses. And so when we look at the, um, the patterns of baseline atrophy in the patients with BVFTD on the connectome, so what I'm showing here is the healthy connectome on the top and then the patient connectome on the bottom. And the regions in red are the regions that have high atrophy, and you see that they're pretty well circumscribed within this sort of like sector of the, of the connectome. And then the yellow is the regions that are identified as the epicenters in those patients. And then, so you see that they're in a few different islands. We see some in this the salience network, we see some in the frontal parietal network, and we see some in the default mode network. And so what we're gonna do next is, sit, is look at where the longitudinal atrophy goes. And so that's the orange dots here. And so I'll just toggle between these for a sec. And so you can see the orange on the, um, on the brains is the regions that are showing high longitudinal atrophy. And so what you can see is that the orange dots are kind of radiating out from the areas that have high atrophy at baseline, which is what we'd expect it if in a connectivity-based model or based fashion of spread. And so if you look at the predictions from our model and how it matches that, this is, this is the model predictions and this is the actual data. So I'll just toggle between those a few times. And the model is not perfect, but the model does a good job of learning that sort of pattern of radiation from the regions that are affected at baseline. Um, and if you look in SVPPA, what we see is that the baseline pattern is still somewhat circumscribed within the connectome, but it's kind of shifted up. So there's this kind of like second axis of connectivity um, that's going from the, the more um, associated frontal parietal regions and shifting up into these regions that are in anterior temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe, which we know are, show a lot of atrophy in this Savannah variant of PPA that's very temporal predominant. And we see that the um, epicenters are located kind of like in those medial temporal and anterior temporal areas. And again, we see this pattern where the longitudinal atrophy is kind of radiating out from the, um, from the epicenters. And again, the model does the same kind of thing where it's pretty good at predicting that it's going to, um, to spread out in this sort of fashion. Um, so that was, a, that was a really quick sort of, um, excursion through that study. There's a number of other things that I didn't quite have time to get into today. We looked at, um, is it better if patients have a single epicenter, if we try multiple epicenters and it looked like single looked a little better. So there's plenty more details in the paper, but um, the big picture summary is that for patients with a different syndrome, we can identify different epicenters that tend to sort of like cluster with each other in the connectome, but um, there's, there's a decent amount of heterogeneity. Um, and so if we use this model, the epicenters and the, and the 
healthy functional connectivity, we can predict or forecast future atrophy in patients with, with both of these very different patterns of atrophy in a single model. So the, the model is just um, making guesses based on connections without being able to sort of like overlearn information from a given syndrome, which was part of our motivation for using a single unified model. Um, and uh, the last um, point I want to make about that study is that it looks like there's this sort of like spatiotemporal kinetics um, where there's this dynamic process of how the disease is moving. And the sigmoid biomarker curves have always like reminded us of that, but this is just like a slightly um, kind of like new spin on that. Um, and the GAM model um, with the Gaussian process regression is, is the, the, this nice class of models that are able to, to model these sort of like nonlinear curves. Um, so they were re really um, useful in this case. Um, and so one of the big questions that's raised by these types of studies, we're looking at connectivity and trying to use that to understand how disease is progressing in the brain. And so there's a lot of great studies in this area um, using structural connectomes and functional connectomes. Um, getting at this, testing this idea of is spread through a, um, through a connectome, either based on like a statistical fitted model like we use or a lot of these um, really interesting models like the uh, exponential um, spreading models and the SIR models that are um, doing like a fully simulated disease spread type modeling. They're all kind of like getting at this idea of how much, how well can we predict the patterns of atrophy or pathology that we see in a disease using the connectome, basically. And so this is a, um, a summary of this sort of like competing models of how diseases might manifest and appear in the brain um, that Bill Seeley published a few years ago. And so the first row is basically what we tested in this study, the idea that the disease onset is unifocal, single epicenter, and all the disease spreads out from that epicenter. And so anywhere that you find pathology or atrophy in the brain subsequently is based on it originating in this um, epicenter, just like a virus can start in a, in a um, specific area. But the, the competing model is that there's a staggered process of onset in different nodes of the brain. And so there's not connection-based spread. There's just region intrinsic processes in each of these nodes that are relating to them getting disease. And what might be driving this sort of onset in regions may potentially relate to their sort of selective vulnerability for the disease. So are they enriched for a certain set of markers, certain class of cells that make that region sort of more um, vulnerable to a pathology like you'd see in ALS in the motor system or Alzheimer's in layer two of the entorhinal cortex. Um, and so, the, and then the third option is that both of these could be at play, that we could be getting this staggered onset due to just ran, pure randomness or to selective vulnerability or to connectivity-based spread or to both of these. And so this is what we're continuing to think about as we use connectomes to predict spread is how much of what we see actually truly transsynaptic spread and how much may be related to just kind of like graded selective vulnerability. Um, and so that notion of graded vulnerability brings up the idea of gradients. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about now, at the time. Okay. Um, so that kind of like brings me to the, the topic of the, um, of the talk today, which is what's the link between functional connectivity and disease progression? We know that functional connectivity is powerful for um, sort of selective vulnerability mapping, but we know that um, functional connectivity is a statistical measure. It's not like a physical measure of connectivity. As everyone knows, it's a statistical me me measure of the dynamic synchrony between regions. And functional connectivity is not equal to structural connectivity. We know there's regions that are strongly functionally connected that don't have strong connections between them detected by DTI. And there's a lot of studies in this area. Um, so there's this kind of like conundrum that remains to kind of unresolved. Um, and furthermore, we know that functional networks are changing over time. Um, 
across aging and disease, we know that there's these sort of like nonlinear patterns. It's not just that connectivity is reducing. We know that intra versus intramodular connectivity or have different dynamics and and that um, there's sort of like U-shaped. Just shaped put them in the box. They'll find them. That there's a uh, U-shaped trajectories of change. So we'll probably take we, the mirror out. We have to think about um, how uh, how that's going to relate to how disease might spread. And then beyond functional connectivity, we know that there's just phenotypic variability in the brain that relates to anatomic gradients. And so there's a lot of nice work that's coming out in this area, um, including from some um, nice work in, at the MNI, like in Born, Boris Bernhardt's group. And I really enjoyed the, uh, the gradients pre-symposium uh, before HBM. It's just exciting to see all of the work that's um, going on in this area. And um, we're sort of late to this game, but we started thinking about what, how do gradients relate to selective vulnerability. We know about functional connectivity gradients from the, um, the wonderful Margulies study and many others that have followed in that sort of vein. Um, and that there's a lot of phenotypic variability as we can read out with gene expression, like from the Allen Brain Atlas. And so what we wanted to look at was, can we look at brain activity and look at dynamics and try and study different gradients of brain activity and see what that might teach us, start to teach us about selective vulnerability. And so just as a reminder of like the dynamics of brain activity during resting state. So this is just one subject from the human connectome project during a resting state scan and just these, you know, anti-correlations and oscillations and spreading and all of this sort of richness in here. Um, and what we wanted to try and do was say, can we find the primary dimensions of activity? So rather than starting with functional connectivity, if we just look at variations in activity and individual fMRI volumes, what can we learn about the main dimensions of, of variability? Um, and so the way that we approached this was with, um, with deep learning. So we used a dimensionality reduction method called a, um, an autoencoder. So in this case, we used this three-dimensional convolutional autoencoder. And what we did was we took 100 subjects resting state data from the, from the HCP and we separated that into 120,000 fMRI volumes. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass them through this autoencoder that basically learns a dimensionality reduction. And it does that by passing all of this information through this sort of bottleneck layer that has 1,080 dimensions and attempts to reconstruct the original volume after passing the information through this bottleneck. So this is basically like this compression decompression algorithm that's trying to learn an optimal dimensionality reduction of the data. And so we do that and we um, sort of fit this model. We get an embedding for each of our 120,000 volumes, um, which is what comes out of this middle layer. And then we're gonna pass those through a subsequent PCA. So we can basically just resort the dimensions based on the amount of variance that they explain. Um, and uh, so basically this is like a nonlinear dimensionality reduction followed by a linear sort of like post-processing step. And so if, when we look in the latent space of brain activity, so this is just the first two dimensions of this space, each dot is an fMRI um, volume. And volumes that are clustered together here, they're, they're more similar in their overall brain activity patterns. And that's what the main the dimensions are representing here. Um, when we train the encoder, all of the volumes are scrambled in time. So the encoder doesn't know anything about this scan, this volume came from this subject or the temporal order. It's just learning spatial patterns. So if we want to look at the sort of trajectory of dynamics in this space, we need to connect the dots after the fact. Um, so I'll try and pick up the pace here. Um, so when we look at the latent space and we say, okay, so how much of the variance in the 3D activation patterns do we see in the first, um, in the first few dimensions of the space? And basically what we find is that it looks like a low dimensional space, which um, basically reproduces what a lot of other people have looked at gradients in this field have found, that it looks like, um, there's a relatively low dimensional set of factors that are kind of like influencing the patterns of activity that we see in resting state. So 
What's interesting here is the first dimension explains a third of the variance. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that first dimension because it's um, it was a little bit surprising to us. Um, and by the time we get to nine dimensions, we're explaining about 60% of the variance and we're getting up towards an elbow. So I'm just going to mention these nine for now. Um, and this is just the same sort of variance, showing the variance per component for those first nine, just um, reiterating the point that this first great gradient or dimension really explains like a lot of variance. And so what we did was we took one subject and we just said if we put all of their volumes from their fMRI scan and look at the trajectory of that in latent space, what does it look like? And this is the pattern of um, activity dynamics on the first two dimensions of the latent space. I'll just let you look at that for a second. So as we see the subject oscillating, we see that there's some non-randomness to this. There's some continuity in these trajectories. It has these other interesting properties like um, some sort of momentum and acceleration and this tendency to sort of like return to the center of this space. So we wanted to unpack what these dimensions are and I'm just going to describe that for you and then, um, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so if we want to understand what one of these latent activity dimensions represents, so this is a, a summary of um, one subject scan and their trajectory in this latent space, just shown here on two dimensions. And just as a reminder, so each dot here represents a different fMRI volume. And so you see this sort of like continuous pattern of um, sort of migrating through this space. And so if we want to understand what one of these dimensions represents, here's the procedure that we used. So we would take a given voxel across all of our fMRI volumes for all the subjects, so 120,000, and we'd look at the voxel bulb activity levels. And then we'd look for each of the volumes where that position was um, sort of uh, situated along this dimension. So some volumes are at the right side, some are at the left. And so if you correlate a voxel's activity with the volumes position on each dimension, you get this regression plot. And you get a beta weight that tells you how that voxel's activity is affected as you move from the left to the right in this space. And we do that for each voxel, and what that makes is this map that essentially looks like a gradient map. So as you move to the right of this space, some voxels go up and others go down, and vice versa as you go in the other direction. And if you were to do this for the second dimension, you'd get a different gradient pattern. And so you can imagine these two are sort of playing with each other in concert to influence the overall levels of activity that you're seeing. And so if this is just a snapshot of a subject's trajectory and we want to think about, okay, so what are these, each of these gradients doing? How, what's like a good um, sort of conceptual model for how that works? And this is the way that we, um, this is the way that we think about that. So if they have a, a volume here, it's high on the y-axis and low and zero on the x-axis. What that means is that this gradient slope is going to be positive. And regions that have a strong weight on that gradient slope, their bold activity is going to go up. And the other gradient, because of where this um, volume is situated in this space, is going to have a flat slope. And then as you move through this space, one slope is going to go down, and the other one is going to go up. And both of these are these input independent influences on the region's overall brain activity. Um, so this is a way to think about what are the dynamics of these gradients where we've determined the dimensions just based on the activation pattern. So we haven't told the model anything about the functional connectivity. We're kind of like reconstructing that post hoc. And so what you can, what you can see is that if two regions are on the same side of a gradient, their bold signals are going to go up together and down together. So essentially, they're going to be functionally connected as far as it pertains to that gradient. But then when you have multi multiple of these at play, that's where we start to get these rich patterns. And so I just want to look for a second at a couple of these gradients and show you a few interesting things that we found. Um, so the first gradient, the one that explains so much variance, what we find is that this is the only gradient that appears unipolar. So all of the regions go up together or all of the regions go down together. And what we found is that that is basically is how the global signal behaves in the brain. So all the regions go up or all the regions go down. And some people regress that out, some don't. 
Um, but what we see is that there's this spatial variability in that pattern. So when this signal goes up, when this gradient gets deeper, some regions are affected more than others. So there's this sort of heterogeneity in this pattern. Um, and what we see is that if you look at that pattern and you correlate it to other interesting data sets, like if we look at the Allen Brain Atlas and we take the principal component of gene expression and we correlate that with this gradient, we get a correlation of 0.72. Um, and there's this nice study by Burton colleagues that showed that um, the principal component of gene expression in the Allen basically relates to sensory versus association. And so what we see is that the sensory regions are sort of more highly loaded onto this global signal gradient, if you want to call it that. Um, and we also see that they have a strong correlation with the cortical myelination gradient, um, which is what was shown in, the, in this uh, nice BERT study. And so what we're finding here is that it looks like there's this relationship between genetic expression across the brain, variable gen genetic expression, cortical myelination, so like a structural factor, and then this functional factor that relates to the global signal. Um, the second gradient we see has this really strong correspondence with the princ principal functional connectivity gradient with an R of 0.82. So basically, we're happy to see that we were able to um, sort of reproduce that gradient using this, um, you know, kind of uh, complementary approach for, for determining gradients. Um, and just two other things I want to highlight here. So um, getting back to selective vulnerability, so this gradient five, what we find is that um, the regions that are positively loaded on it are in the salience or the ventral attention network, and visual regions are negatively loaded on it. And what we find is that across the 16,000 or so genes in the Allen that we were looking at, the gene that had the top spatial correlation with this gradient was this FABP6. So it had an R of 0.6. And we found this really interesting because this is one of the known markers for Bon Economo neurons, which are these recently evolved neurons that are most expressed in the insula and anterior cingulate cortex. And we know that those voxels, or sorry, those um, areas are selectively vulnerable to TDP pathology. And we also know that um, the insula and the cingulate are the places where a TDP disease is likely to start. So it may be that this gradient is re reflecting some sort of pattern of functional variability across the brain that may explain why we often see epicenters kind of like in these cingulate and insular regions, it may help us think about, okay, so what might be the cellular um, elements of an epicenter um, for a specific disease? And so that's what's getting us excited about using gradients when we think about disease modeling. Um, there's a few other interesting things here, like different gradients um, sort of encompassing different aspects of the DMN, different subcomponents of the DMN. And then we find a couple gradients that are highly lateralized, so either left greater than right or right greater than left. Um, and so you can imagine using each of these gradients, like many other people have talked about, is this sort of like toolkit of functions that you could use to adjust each of these gradients like a seesaw and achieve a lot of different activation patterns that you might want, like, you know, for a language task, for example. Um, so just to wrap this up, sorry, I'm a little long on time here, but, so when we derive this brain activity latent space, we see that the different dimensions represent these kind of like intrinsic functional gradients that um, relate in large part to gradients that have previously been described. But I think there's a few new interesting nuances when you use this activity approach um, and that they relate to the different underlying, that they seem to kind of like underlie the different functional connectivity networks. Um, and we see that the different gradients relate to these different kind of like systems of organization of function, function and uh, genetics and structure, and that the dynamics, so if you get different dynamic patterns, you can kind of um, start to think about different functional connectivity states. And I didn't really have time to talk about that today, but we have a preprint that's coming out on this probably in the next few days, um, and that has a lot more information. Um, and so that, the final sort of question I think about thinking about gradients and functional connectivity and how diseases progress is, are the diseases truly spreading transsynaptically? We don't have a, lot, a ton of great evidence for that in humans yet. Um, or is it possible that it's sort of staggered onset of regions across a gradient that sort of gives the appearance of, of 
spread, but is actually just staggered based on a gradient, or are these two interacting? It doesn't have to be an either or, it could be that both of these things are contributing. And so we may be able to build better models in the future by using both these pieces of information. Um, and so, yeah, that's it for me today. Um, I'd like to thank all of the patients and the caregivers that participated in our first study and uh, many of my great colleagues at the MAC, especially Bill Seeley, who's been a major contributor to all this work. And Lorenzo and Alex are some great collaborators in the lab who've contributed a lot. So um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, great, Jesse. Thanks so much for your talk. That was really fascinating. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them. Um, or if you're feeling not shy uh, and, and bold, go ahead and unmute and, and ask Jesse directly. Um, I might just kick this off. So it looks like you know we have certain epicenters where disease start and then potentially propagate through the network. I'm wondering um, how much, as you mentioned, like there's actually potentially both processes occurring because the pathology may spread between neurons, but then once you have the neurons die, they're gonna be just releasing that pathology more locally as well. So you could mm -hmm. have both that network and the just the diffuse local spread happening. Um, but that would also vary by disease stage as well. Um, right. Can, do you wanna comment on that? Or is that something that we can effectively model or is that a little bit I too complex? No, I think we can model it. Like you could have a, a spatial, you could have a connectivity based fact factor of progression and you could have a spatial factor. So if you imagine like a geodesic distance along the cortex and that as the cell is dying, it's just sort of like radiating out from there. And so it's just going to kind of like ooze into adjacent regions, basically. Um, in our paper, we did have like a spatial factor because one of our reviewers was like, you, you should try and show that this is uh, connectivity above and beyond just spatial spread. Um, so, and if you look at, um, you know, postmortem sort of like slides of pathology, you definitely see this kind of like expansion of tau along the cortex. And so it's, it's hard to imagine that it's just connectivity. It seems like, like you say, like, especially it's the later disease stage that it's really likely to just radiate outwards. All right. So we have a question from uh, Simon Ducharme. Um, I noticed your W maps for atrophy, you control for handedness. Was this decided on a theoretical basis because of lateralization of language uh, versus SVPPA? Or did you test if it made a difference in your results? That's an interesting question. Um, we didn't test if it affected our results. And it was, it was um, not highly theoretically motivated. It was more kind of like trying to use the sort of primary factors that might influence variability in gray matter um, across our sort of sample of controls that we're referencing each patient to. But there's a lot of interesting findings about um, handedness maybe being a, a factor that relates to, you know, lifelong patterns of, of um, you know, gray matter variability in the brain, and that may actually be a risk factor for certain things, especially with SVPPA, which is this highly lateralized um, disease like the, the question mentions. So um, it's absolutely something that we should look into. A colleague of mine, Zach Miller at the MAC, is really interested in this idea of um, handedness as a risk, for, as a lifelong risk factor for neurodegenerative disease. So um, short answer is no, we haven't looked at it, but um, we'd like to look there more. All right, do we have any other questions? I'll jump in with another one while we're waiting. <laughs> All right. So, Jesse, have you looked at any um, other um, scans that are maybe acquired um, earlier in the disease stages or potentially longitudinal prospective studies like an ADNI where you might have healthy controls that move into an MCI or an AD group and potentially identify epicenters, you know, at those earlier stages um, or potentially even like predict diagnosis on the basis of... Um, seeing what's happening, where these epicenters might be. Yeah, um, we specifically, me specifically, have not like looked too much at that yet, but it's it's one of the directions that we, we're heading. And so in ADNI with people who have MCI, and um, there's a few FTD cohorts of people who are 
gene carriers who are pre-symptomatic, but we know are um, likely heading in a disease course. And so looking in those individuals and defining epicenters early um, is really important for like getting at, at disease origins. It's, um, we need to think more about identifying the epicenter because at that point, if there's just a really subtle atrophy pattern, or I know people even started thinking about this idea in sort of non-neurodegenerative syndromes, like in schizophrenia and see it's sort of differences in sort of like gray matter variability that kind of look like an epicenter. Um, and so if you're using a spatial correlation method, you need to be careful because you're considering every voxel in the brain. And so in that case, I wonder if the fully simulated models that say, okay, we plop the disease in this region and it spreads out. And then we see that a person has a subtle change in, you know, the entorhinal cortex or in the thalamus. Does that predict a pattern that you'd expect? And maybe the simulated approach plus the kind of postdoc approach like we use could like play well together to get at that. All right. Okay, so we have a couple more questions that have come in. So Jake Vogel asks, um, first of all, he said, it's an amazing talk. In the second study, Actually. you uh, evaluated the utility of this new functional brain parameter space in predicting behaviors in human connectome project. Would you think it might be helpful in prediction above and beyond typical edgewise features? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and behavior is always a nice way to kind of like anchor the, uh, the variability that you're seeing with these types of approaches. Um, we haven't really looked at the behavior yet. What we have looked at is individual sort of like fingerprints of connectivity difference. And do we see that individuals have characteristic sort of trajectories in this space? And if you look on day one and day two, are they are reliable within an indiv individual? And does that relate to these sort of different patterns of functional connectivity that we see in subject A versus subject B. And we do see that and um, we, we shared those results in the preprint. We haven't looked at, um, at behavior yet, but um, we, we definitely like to. Um, and there's all, you know, all of these amazing multivariate approaches like PLS and CCA seem like a, a nice way to try, and, um, to try and unpack that. All right. So Simon asked another question. Do you have any analyses based on individual atrophy connectivity profile looking at predicting the rate of atrophy and disease progression in addition to the anatomical distribution of atrophy? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, so in, in our paper, we were actually predicting the rate and the pattern. So for each region, our, our outcome measure was effectively the the delta of the W score and the W is kind of like a Z. So what we were trying to predict was the amount of change per year um, in each region. And then you can use that to make summaries about for this part of the brain versus this part of the brain. Are we predicting that the kind of mean rates of change are gonna be different? Um, and that's really important for when you're thinking about a clinical trial and if you're trying to like administer some kind of treatment that's going to slow the rate of change, you want your model to be able to make a good prediction of what the actual uninterrupted rate of change would be so that you would know, okay, if we want to slow that by 30% or 40%. So that's one of the big motivations, I think, for, for like you um, suggest, like being able to generate a good prediction of the actual rate of change. All right. Are there any additional questions? Well, we're just about at five o'clock. Oh, I know, Boris Bernhard jumped in. Uh, fascinating talk, thank you. I noticed that the GAM modeling from project one included spatial autocorrelations. Can you elaborate on this approach a bit further? A related question is whether one should assume different brain areas to have a different spatial autocorrelation functional connectivity profile than others and thus have trivially stronger associations to structural atrophy maps that had a given autocorrelation? That is a good question. Um, yeah, so the GAM um, has a, the GAM that we use, so we use this package called MGC, MGCV and R that has a sort of option for including a spatial autocorrelation where you tell the model 
the distance between each region and every region. And it tries to model that with this function that's called a matern function. Um, the truth is that it was not the most elegant or beautiful way to do spatial autocorrelation correction. And I'm really um, excited about these new approaches with surrogates, like this brain smash toolbox that I learned about at HBM that's generating all of these sort of surrogate um, spatial correlation maps. So you can see if the spatial pattern that you see is correlated with some outcome measure like longitudinal atrophy above and beyond what you'd expect with chance. And I think that that type of approach might be able to capture this sort of spatial spatial variability and autocorrelation. I need to think about that a little bit more. Um, that's a really good question though, because we know that, you know, signals different in ventral anterior temporal lobes and OFC, and then there's just differences in the sort of like complexity of the cortex and the gradients of how much things are changing. So it's a that's a really important thing for us to solve to really test these models. All right, so one final question. Um, so I guess this follows up on other uh, discussions with Jake Vogel related to, um, so if genomic gradients give rise to brain networks, how can we disentangle these and how it relates to disease progression? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a tough one. I mean, yeah, we, you'd want to see, I think one thing that would be nice to see is really be able to see like molecular pathology moving longitudinally along some regions that you knew were physically connected to each other or you knew were not connected to each other but were functionally connected. It seems like that could, if you had longitudinal molecular pathology and high confidence macroscopic connectivity, maybe you could start to tease that apart. All right, Jesse, thank you so much. Boris follows up with like, thank you and an amazing talk. I think, uh, I think everyone here feels like this is really amazing work you're doing. We appreciate your sharing it with us. And um, we look forward to reading the work um, in BioArchive or when it comes out uh, after peer review. Good luck. And um, thank we look you. forward to talking to you more in the future. So thanks so much, Nathan. Thanks for uh, everyone for joining me. It was uh, really exciting to get to talk to you all. And yeah, hope to keep interacting with you guys a lot in the future. All right. Have a good one. Okay. Take care.